Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11. I'm going to read from here. If you have your Bibles, you can also check so that we are on the same page. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort of his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your heart tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Verse 5. Let's start reading from verse 5 together now. I want to read. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should declare that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father so what we title this teaching this evening is I want to consider what we call the attitude of christ the attitude of christ let's do well to share the links with our friends the attitude of christ so this is going to take us all right, quite some time. So here, I would like to start with what, what, I, what I would personally call the basis, all right, of our unity. Paul here is actually advocating Christian unity, but there is a basis for Christian unity. If you remember, some time ago, we mentioned about Christian partnership. Do you remember? And we said partnership in the gospel, all right, partnership with the spirit. And then we identified certain things. But let's start from verse number one now. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Now, if you're looking at your version of the Bible, one of the things you will notice is, is using the word is there, or I think if it is KJV, you will see the word if, right? Does the Bible have if? Now, you would naturally think that if sounds like it may, right? Or it may not be. But this expression here is really not that. The expression if here is actually saying, owing to the fact or knowing that because it's a certainty that the things that Paul actually ident identifies and itemizes here are actually in Christ. So he's not really asking, it's not, an, it's not a question. It's actually what should be a reality, that actually these things are in Christ. Or we can use the word because. Do you see that? Now, let us look at the things that we see in Christ here. That as a result of your declaration of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your confession and your profession, one of the things we actually see that is very clear it's the first verse. Look at it. Any encouragement. So one of the things that we see in Christ's realities that we have is what? Encouragement. We live in a fallen world among fallen people. The wear and tear, the stress, the friction, interactions, relationships, disappointments, setbacks, letdowns, all kinds of things come against us. But in Christ, we have encouragement. That means that, you see, the, the, when it comes to encouragement, because all these words are actually intertwined, all right? When it comes to encouragement, you personally know that to encourage somebody else, there must be something good that you are promising that can encourage a person. For example, if a woman is pregnant, 
and she's in a tr second trimester or how do you call it now let's say she's in seven months and she's feeling you know pangs and pain that that which gives the woman joy is not the pregnancy is the baby that will be born after the labor is over so that tells you that when christ encourages us the encouragement we get from christ actually cannot be gotten anywhere else in the world why is it human beings that encourage us are finite after a while they will get sick or they will go old they will die some of us receive encouragement for, from our parents consistently after a while to our parents will die we receive from our friends but all our friends will not be together with us for life but it comes to a point where we now need to actually settle it once and for all that the richest the greatest the most certain source of encouragement is in christ jesus so we receive strength and comfort because the love of jesus christ for us far exceeds any loss that we may experience encouragement from belonging to christ you live in a world where the absolutes are gradually shifting and sometimes the lines have become so blurry that we are not even sure what to believe again with respect to morality with respect to abortion with respect to purity with respect to eternal destiny and so there are people coming up and saying hell is just a fiction right eternity is just an illusion it's a figment of man's imagination we are not sure what to believe again but we are clear from scripture that Jesus actually encourages us by his word to his disciples. And we're going to see some of them. For example, if you look at, I think, John 14 now. Let's look at John 14, verse 1. There is encouragement in Christ, both for here and hereafter. John chapter 14, verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I am going to, I would not have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then he says, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Right? So what you see is that the eternal destiny of the believer in Jesus Christ is not an illusion is not uncertain it's not unclear we are sure that anyone who puts in tr his trust in the resurrected one should expect a better resurrection that is what theologians or scripture even call the blessed hope so for the child of god and this should encourage you my friend for the child of god our we cannot have our best life now our best is yet to come. If eternity with God is not better than what we are experiencing now, do we want eternity with God? Are, are you understanding? What's the difference? If we get to heaven and there, there is still murder, right? There are still wicked politicians. The economy is still terrible. Potentials are being wasted daily. No, 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 no. What we want to see is we want to be sure that Jesus is not promising an utopia. Is something superior. Listen, the best. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about it before? The ideal life. Have you ever thought about it before that? If life can just be like this, have you ever thought about it before that? Ah, imagine we had good roads, a big pipe on water, I mean the basic things. And then some of us will go an extra mile and say, No, imagine I had my car. All right, imagine I have beautiful children, the finest children on Instagram with their big chubby cheeks and long hair, even though you know you don't have long hair, you know, and all that. I say, oh, you wish life was like that. I'm saying the greatest of man's ideal, when it comes to heaven and eternity, it surpasses it. Why? Our finite minds cannot even comprehend the best of the best, actually. Are you here? That even if God says, okay, use your creativity and create the best thing, you will find out that you will still be limited, especially as a result of the fall. Are we together? Another thing we also see, if you look at John, also, John, all right, chapter 15, verse 11. You say the same thing john chapter 15 verse 11 we have encouragement in christ john chapter 15 verse 11 as simple as this sound is deep theology i have told you these things look at this so that you will be filled with my joy 
That means that the joy of the believer actually rests on hearing and receiving and believing and acting on that which the Lord has actually said. So our joy is actually knowledge and revelation dependent. No, but there is nothing called stumbling into joy by chance. There is no, you know, when you say, I just mistakenly entered into joy. There's no mistake. There is intentionality that must be engaged if you will walk in joy. Because remember that love is a fruit of the spirit and it requires partnership with the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Also, joy is a fruit of the spirit and it requires partnership with the Holy Spirit. Say with me, I'm joyful. I'm joyful. Say, because I, know. because I know. Yes. If you remember Romans 8, 28, we know that all things. So there is a knowledge that sponsors joy. So the, listen, you are as joyful as your knowledge base. Now, you know what I mean by knowledge base? I'm not just talking of buying books without reading them. I'm not just talking of having a Bible without reading them. I'm not just saying following online prayer, but not studying your Bible personally. I'm saying actually you are pressing into scripture to find out what the word of God says. And then as you assimilate it, as you receive it, as you apply it, what happens? It becomes like what the prophet said, that your word was to me like honey. They were a joy and the rejoicing of my soul. He says, oh, how I love thy precepts, for it is my meditation day and night. He says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The entrance of thy word gives light and understanding unto the simple. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein that thou mayest be able to do, to observe, to do, all right, according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. When Israel was languishing under the whiplash of the Egyptian taskmasters, the Bible says, when they cried to him, what did God do? He sent his word. Psalm 107 verse 20. The word healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Nehemiah would also teach us. He says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. David, a man after God's heart, will also teach us that actually it is with joy that you will draw water out of the wells of salvation. The joy of the Lord is your strength, but your strength will be revealed in the day of adversity but before the day of adversity comes you must strengthen your joy that means listen joy is in levels are, are you together my friends joy is revelation knowledge and revelation based so so you, you see john 15 11 right i've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy yes your joy will overflow your joy will overflow so are you seeing the difference now? There is the place of filling with joy and then there is overflow. So that means you can say, oh, I'm filled with joy. Thank God. But you must be being filled with joy. That means that, listen, your interaction with scripture actually pumps joy. Listen, it is impossible to interact with scripture for some time and joy will not begin to well up. Remember that joy is not circumstances based. It's reality based. And when I mean reality, I'm not talking of physical reality. For, listen, the things that are seen are actually made from the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen, they are eternal. So what I'm saying is that when you look from the lens of the cross, when you look from the lens of the resurrected Christ, when you look from the, the lens of the ascend ascended one, when you look from the lens of the high priest that sits at the right hand of the majesty on night, that is sure to return, then you know that no matter what happens in this life, you have peace, you have joy. Are you seeing that? Our response to life circumstances is on the basis of the quality of doctrine that we imbibe. That's why I've taught you that the teaching of the word of God is spiritual warfare. Because the enemy is against your joy. Praise God. So have you seen people, they are, they are feeling down and people will tell them, eh, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad does not stop a man from feeling bad. I don't know if you understand it, my brother. You understand? People say, oh, don't feel bad. Listen, telling me not to feel bad does not change my state. It is when an information is supplied. I say, okay. Okay, now. For example, let, let's look at something. Uh, let's look for an example. Holy Spirit, help me. In terms of response to situation. A student is going to school. And then the bike, they want to go and check results. And if she fell down and scratched her knee. 
you know she will naturally feel bad or her face hey ladies that don't play with their faces and then there's a mark like this <laughs> while she's feeling bad about it a class governor now calls and say the lecturers want to see you. hey what have i done and then they said out of 13 courses you had 12 a's and one b's all the 12 a's are in four four unit course the the b is in a two unit course how do you think she will feel <laughs> that is what christ gives us the joy in christ always far outweighs the sorrow in the world why there is an overflow somebody say overflow it's an overflow again we go to john look at chapter 16 verse 33 one of my personal dealings with god all right and which is important for a faithful bible teaching ministry is not to rush a text all right if i rush the text and just finish everything in one hour the depth will not be able to plunge into the depth right that's why we do expository bible study all right expository means verse by verse line by line precept upon precept that's how we grow amen John chapter 16, look at verse 33 now. John 16, 33. Are we there? I've told you all this. Uh huh. So that you may have peace in me. Are you seeing the things we have in Christ? So that you may have peace in Nigeria government. So that you may have peace in America government. You know, some. Some of our people will travel and you will hear things like one of the most common things among Nigerians that travel. One of the most common words is over there, things work. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't even know what you are going into. You are going into a collapsing nation. The foundations that built that nation are already being shattered. But on the surface, it looks beautiful. It's like painting a wall that has cracks. After a while, the interior decoration will be, it will be, everything will be wasted. Why? The foundation of morality, of godliness, of commitment is being torn into shreds. So why they think they have peace that all oh, things are working? It may not be so. I was talking to one of my mentors today and he told me that it is easier to do ministry in Nigeria than abroad. You know why? The level of ideological warfare over there is not strong yet. The average person here may not really be given to critical thinking. Does it even understand the basic laws of logic? Are you here now? John 16, 33, look at what Jesus said. I have told you. I have told you. Do you see that? All these. So that you may have what now? Peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. Some other translation will say tribulation, right? But he uses the word. He says, but take heart. Because I have overcome the word. Or be of good cheer, for I have overcome the word. That means that there is no peace outside Christ. There is no encouragement outside Christ that is superior to what Christ can give you. There is, listen, there is no good substitute for Christ. In time and in eternity. I think that makes sense. There is no good, sufficient substitute for Christ in time and in eternity. So he's saying, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Yes, there is. Any comfort from his love? Yes, there is. It's a heaven of refuge, reassurance, calming relief, that consolation. Now, there are many great benefits for belonging to Christ. We have seen, all right, encouragement. There is also comfort of his love. Now, when we talk about comfort of his love, all right, for example, remember that there is a name that the Holy Spirit is called, right? It's the word, is the name Paracletos. Do you remember now? I hope you know that Paraclet, only women also share that name with the Holy Spirit. Christ is the first comforter. The Holy Ghost is the another comforter. Same of the same kind. Allos Paracletos. All right. And then women. When God said to Adam, I will make an help meet for him. is the same word Paraclet. Now, what is Paraclet? All right. Who is that helper? Because the Holy Spirit is called our helper. 
Now, th that word, the root meaning in the Greek, actually means one called. Do you see that? Alongside to help. Say with me, paraclet or helper is one that is called alongside to help. So, so there is this coming alongside to help another person. So that means that when the Bible says that we have come forth from his love, it's true. How do we mean? The person of Jesus is not on earth. The person of Jesus is in heaven. Do you agree? Because the Bible says the same way you saw him go. That means he's gone. But the presence of Jesus is still with us in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the adumbration of the presence of Jesus is what we see in the communication and fellowship of the Spirit. That means that although Jesus is in heaven, we know that since he is co-equal and co-eternal, he's also omnipresent. Are, are you with me tonight? So when we say comfort, there is a comfort of his love. And what does that tell you? That he props us up from the inside. There are times we want to be down. But just knowing that the maker of creation, the one by whom God made the world, the one to whom, for whom all things were made, by whom all things were made, right, loves you. I don't know if it has happened to you before where you feel rejected. You feel people have walked away from you. They don't really want to relate. Those that you really care about or you look up to and you feel they should understand me. Have, have you seen that? And in that phase, they don't seem not to be forthcoming. It can even happen among couples, right? The husband does not understand the wife. The wife does not understand the husband. Listen, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So when we're talking about comfort, we are saying like a shock absorber in the midst of life's turbulence, the knowledge of the love of God keeps you at peace. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. You must allow these words to strengthen your heart. There are times you feel down. It happens to all of us. But no, always remind yourself, I'm loved by the Lord. Greater love hath no man than thee, than a man lays life for his friends. You see that? You know it's scripture. Let's in call and response just one more time. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay his life for his friends. Greater love, than a man. It's scripture now. Greater love, love hath no man than this, than a man, than a man lay his life for his friends. He says that scarcely for a righteous man would anyone die. I don't know if I'm a righteous man in terms of 100% perfection because we are all towards it. And by the time we see the law face to face, we continue. But I'm saying that even the best among us, we don't, we really would die for. How many of you can die for me here today? Once that say, I can, she, she, she says, I cannot die for you. <laughs> I cannot die for you, Jerry. You are married. I'm not yet married. I can't die for you. You see, but that's how life is. We listen, I can tell you I love you so much, but I don't know if I can die for you. I can take some blows for you, but that will die. Ah. <laughs> when did we start life now? Yet, the son, the only begotten son of God, the unique son of God, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that one hung on the cross. For people that, the Bible says when it was done, some still doubted. They deserted from Gethsemane. We already knew that there was a problem. And they left him alone. Yet, he stood, he endured it. He said I could actually, the snap of a finger right now, legions of angels, they are waiting. But he said, no, I will endure and I will go through it. Now, if Jesus could die for you while you were a sinner, now that you are in Christ, what else can he not give you? 
I'm saying that the love of God for you is not dependent on your doings. It's dependent on your believing. Are you learning something? I hope you get the balance. You know what we teach in this ministry. That does not mean you're living immorally. Are you seeing that? You are deliberately sinning and rejoicing. No, no. There is already scripture that says in the book of Hebrews that if we sin willfully, all right, there is no more sacrifices. There remain no more sacrifices for sin. So you understand the balance. We are not saying going ahead to blaspheme, reject Christ, walk away and all that. And then now say, ah, it doesn't matter. He doesn't have a choice. No, no, no. The Holy Ghost is not a bed in a cage. That's why we call him the spirit of the Lord. Now, we see that is the, we, we have comfort in Christ. And another thing we also see, all right, from the love of Christ, is that we have fellowship together in the spirit. Now, those are the fringe benefits we get for belonging to Christ. Fellowship together in the spirit, right? That's in verse 1. Is that in your Bible? Fellowship together in the spirit. Now, when we say we have, that's Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. When we say we have fellowship together in the spirit, the, the word fellowship, you know, there's a song we used to sing in church when we were much younger. I don't know if you guys still sing it anymore. Do you know there is another fellowship in heaven? I know there is another fellow. Have you been there? Hey, do you know there is another fellowship in heaven? I know there is another fellowship in heaven. Now, this is called fellowship together in the spirit. The word fellowship is the word koinonia. Koinonia has to do with um, relationship. All right, that word fellowship, you're underlining it and then we're highlighting it right now. Fellowship has to do with what? Relationship. It has to do with intimacy. It has to do with common union. That's what we call communion. I wrote about it in my book, His Glorious Presence. Common union. Common union. Communion. It's also the word partnership. Partnership. Write it or joint participation fellowship in the spirit so paul is not saying do we have it we actually have it but he's saying because we have it so second corinthians chapter 13 verse 13 and 14 all right fellowship together in the spirit second corinthians chapter 13 verse 13 and 14 this will bless you are you learning something tonight already all of God's people here send you their greetings. There is a reason why I began with 13 instead of 14. All of God's people here send you their greetings. You know what that means? Not everyone is a God person. Not every group is God's group. Not every religion is God's kind of religion. Are you understanding? Not every faith is the faith. There is an exclusivity to it. And yet, there is an all-inclusivity to it. What do I mean? Exclusive in the sense that only those who put their faith in Jesus Christ receive the gift of eternal life, righteousness and justification by faith, being justified freely as a result of the work of His grace. He says we have peace with God and the fellowship. Are you together now? So I'm saying that Although it is exclusive in the sense that only those who have faith, all right, there's what we call foreknowledge and predestination unto salvation. However, when we receive the life of Christ, then it becomes all inclusive, meaning all of us in Christ have fellowship in the spirit. There is nothing like I'm a Christian, I don't have fellowship in the spirit. The spirit becomes the eternal bond that binds believers together in unity. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm saying it does not matter whether you are a Chinese Christian or you are a Tarok Christian or you are a Kogi Christian or you are an Ekiti Christian or you are Hispanic Latino Christian. What matters is if we are in Christ. All of us are new creation. You know what that means? In Christ, you are my brother, you are my sister. Whether we are, we, we are friends, 
we met before or we've never met. Why? We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one fellowship, one God and Father of all, who is above all, in all and through all. Praise God. Hallelujah. Do you see that now? We have fellowship in the spirit. Now let's read verse 14 together. Everybody, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14 together. Are we ready now? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Let's go. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we see that Christ also gives? Grace. He says he will give grace and glory. Nothing good will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He says the law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Ye are saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ has appeared unto all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness. Now, so you see grace. Christian life from start to finish is a work of grace. For it is God that is at work in us, both to will and to do of his good player. Amen. Now, he says here, may the grace, now let's read now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh -huh, and the love of God now, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Uh -huh. So you see that here, we know that it's Paul's final greetings and his prayer, but look at the word again, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You, you are going to notice something here that is very beautiful. Do you actually notice that in this text? Now, I've taught you in our Equip Bible course. Please do well. Try to register all right, for our Equip Bible course. It's one of the cheapest Bible courses in Nigeria, in the world. It's very cheap. But on the, I'm talking about based on the kind of content and value you receive. It's way cheaper. It's too cheap. So cheap. It will bless you. Now, we made it that way so that students and young people and those who are not really financially buoyant can also still receive of the blessing now in equip bible course i'll just give you a teaser here i actually teach on the subject of the trinity and i teach that the the the, the, ju the judeo-christian worldview is actually monotheism not polytheism deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 he says yeah o israel the lord our god is one god now this is it if we say that he is one god and yet we say he's three one what is so so where do we see the you see the, so we now begin to ask is the bible line does the Bible identify God as three or three in one? Or is it God, the pantheon of gods? Now, there are two, there are actually three scriptures, but there are two scriptures that are quite popular that shows you the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the same verse. Not even the same chapter, the same verse. Number one is that at the baptism of John, are you here? At the baptism of John, when Jesus was stepping out of the Jordan River, what did the Bible say? And there was a voice from heaven, the Father speaking. And then he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So if he calls that man coming out of Jordan's son, that means he is the father. My friend, stay with me. You're not paying attention. Stay with me. Are you here? If he calls the man coming out of Jordan's son, that means if he says my beloved son, that means he is the father. Is that correct? But also notice that in the same way, the Bible says the heavens were opened, the spirit capital S, descended in form of a what now? Of a dove. So in that scripture, we see the Father, the Son, and respond louder now. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Also, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, what do we see? The grace of our Lord Jesus. That is the Son, right? The love of God. That is the Father. And the fellowship of the Spirit. So, do you see that the Trinity is not really an argument, actually? The Bible believes, the Bible teaches it. Now, that's it. So, we see here in Christ, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he now says, the love of God and the fellowship, all right? The common union, the participation, the working together, the common sharing. Listen, let me teach it in two, in two, in two aspects. When we say fellowship in the spirit, some of you, if I were to tell you, now go ahead and fellowship in the spirit. What you will do is to speak in tongues. Nothing bad with that. But that is not the basis for fellowship in the spirit. 
Fellowship in the spirit first means that in Christ, all of us actually drink of the same spirit. The Holy Spirit is the superintendent, is the boss, is the governor of the Christian life. Now the Lord is that spirit. How? The spirit is Lord. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm saying that there is a joint participation we have in Christ and then in the Holy Spirit as believers. Then also when we say fellowship in the spirit, we are actually saying that that cord cannot be really seen physically, yet the fruit of it can be seen physically. Then we can now talk about praying in the spirit. And what does that mean? Praying as prompted by the Holy Spirit and then praying in the language, the utterance that the spirit gives us. Are you seeing that? Now that said, are you blessed? He now says something very important. He says, then, that means if we really have encouragement belonging to Christ, all right, or let me use the word, because we have encouragement belonging to Christ, because we have the comfort of his love, because we have fellowship together in the spirit, and our hearts tender and compassionate, I think that's the next thing. So we want to also look at that, you see, one of the things that the Spirit of God actually achieves in a man's life, all right, on the basis of the gospel, is a tender and a compassionate heart. How do I mean? Remember Ezekiel. Ezekiel began to prophesy. And then he said, I will give to you a heart of flesh and take away from you a heart of stone. When you have a heart of flesh, it doesn't mean you are carnal and fleshly. It means God is giving you a heart that is soft, that is tender, a heart that can, exp that can engage what we call long-suffering, a heart that can be patient with others, that is not overly critical and overly sensitive. Do you know there are some people, because of the hardness of their heart, they do not consider doing evil against others as anything wrong. Are we together? They do not see wickedness as a bad thing. Why? Through the hardness of their heart. And one of the things that hardens a man's heart is the deceitfulness of sin. Say so that through the deceitfulness of sin, they have their heart hardened unto destruction. What does the deceitfulness of sin mean? I can continue in sin. There is only one sin that will take me to hell. Every other sin cannot take me to hell. Every sin can take a man to hell. <laughs> I mean, do you understand? There's the nature of sin, but there are also the acts. So you get the idea. Now, if you notice in Romans chapter 5, verse, verse 5, it says, For the love of God is shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. So one of the proofs that you have the Holy Spirit on your inside is that you manifest the love of God. Say with me, one of the marks. One of the marks. You're not saying it today, my friend. Say one of the marks, of the marks. that I have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. on my inside my is that I, that I walk, walk in the love of God. Yes. Let me show you a few scriptures on that. Now, John. John. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord will give you praise. John chapter 13. I just failed to touch on those things. Some of them are not really what I prepared for today. But, but I feel they are important, right? To the faithful, to the scriptures. Now, um, if you look at John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Jesus made a very remarkable statement. You want to see it. You want to see it. John 13, 34 and 35. So now, I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Let's read verse 35 together. One, two, go. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Or some versions will say by this. By this shall all men know. You notice he didn't say by speaking in tongues shall all men know. Is that true? 
It is by speaking in tongues. Why? There are those who are given to Kundalini spirit and those given to all kinds of divination that also mutter gibberish. So it is not by tongues that we will know that we are disciples, but by what? By love. That means because really faith worketh by love. First John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love. First John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. I love that scripture. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. No matter the height of his revelation, if he does not have love, he may attend Pastoralist Bible study all year round. If he does not have love, his Bible study was a waste because he did not come to know God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. First Corinthians, the popular chapter on love. Are, are you seeing the connection of scriptures tonight? First Corinthians, look at chapter 13. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angel, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I did not love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not irritable. Love is not rude. Love does not demand his own way. Love does not keep record of being wrong. Love does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful. Love endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. Wow. But love will last forever. And then I like the last verse. Look at it. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest. Brothers and sisters. And the greatest. Wow. And the greatest of it is what? Is love. I, I mean faith. Faith that can move mountains. Faith about which Jesus said, if you just have faith as small as the grain of a mustard, you will command this mountain to move to yonder place and it will obey you. Faith? Is it not by faith that we enter the kingdom? And yet he says, listen, what about hope? It's rock solid assurance. Hope maketh not ashamed. Yet he says, listen, it doesn't matter. Because he wrote about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. He said, who against hope believed in hope? Yet he's still saying here that among the three, the greatest is love. That means the greatest of all times is not the man that has prophetic gift. He's not a Christian that has written a million books. He's not a Christian that has a great library. He's not a Christian that goes to orphanage every day. He's the Christian that works in sincere love. Are you blessed? Let's make a little more progress. Wow. Now, if you now look at verse number 2 of Philippians chapter 2, now we are in verse 2, of Philippians chapter 2. Then, make me truly, so, 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 are you a lover? Do you love people? That's why one of the things I teach about leadership is, if you are using people, when they leave you, they will hate you. But if you are truly adding value to their lives and serving, do you know that in leadership, one of the things some leaders do not know is that people can see motives after a while. Do you know, after a while, maybe a few weeks, a few months, or a few years, they can actually say, no, he's a sincere man. Do you know there are some people that may be following this ministry because they just feel, I think the man of God is a sincere man. You would think it's because you are the best teacher. You are not even the best teacher anyway. But you would think, oh, I'm a great teacher of the world. That's not why. 
People can see motive. You see, you can't hide it for long. It will show. Do you know if you care about people, they can know. They can. They doesn't care about me at all. You can know. That's why, as a Christian, for you to be salt and light, you must have compassion, or else you will not be able to interact in a way that you'll be able to influence the people you are sent to reach. You know when salt enters soup, it mixes, although it retains its identity. Do you know even in rice, although salt permeates, there is a way you can cook it, and after in some parts, you start noticing there's no salt there. That means salt retains its identity. Salt does not become rice. Rice does not become salt. That's why it's an error, for example, for you to say that when the Holy Spirit enters into you, the container takes up the character um, of the content or thereabout, and then you are the Holy Spirit. That's a wrong way to interpret scripture. Do you understand? You are not a member of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are only a Christian that has the Holy Spirit in you. So as salt also, you can be put in the stew. You can be in the world, but you are not of the world. Because you cannot take up the character of the world. Else you have missed the mandate of the Great Commission. Do you understand? Do you get it? Look at it here. Then, if that's the case, make me truly happy. By agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. You see, scripture is very true. And I've seen the practicality of this truly in the ministry. I mean, while ministering around and all. Do you know that a brother offended is difficult to restore that relationship with the person? L let me show you from scripture. Holy Spirit. Okay, let me just search it out. The scripture is a brother offended. Is more difficult. Huh? Let me look for it. A, a brother offended is harder to be one. Proverbs 18, 19. A brother, you will learn it. It will bless you. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. <laughs> you know, in ancient times, the way they, 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 they took territories was by conquest. Are we together? Was by what? Are we together? Was by what? Conquest. All right, you would enter a territory, you would, you would, you know, win them and then they will be subservient to you. That was how Rome, all right, conquered. And, you know, Alexander the Great and some of these stories you read about. Now, do you know that? Um, he's now saying that it's easier to take a territory physically than to win one brother. He didn't say ten brothers. One brother. Notice he didn't say somebody anyway. One brother offended. That's what the word KJV uses. A brother offended is either to be one than a strong city. You know what that means? Bringing down Jericho that took many days. He still had, yeah, you know, that's plus supernatural power. Is, uh, is, is simpler than reconciling with a brother. Hey, somebody say, hey. That's why when Jesus will teach us, he says, listen, in Matthew, uh, if a brother has, if you have a thing against a brother, a brother offends you, he say you go first. I mean, look at the procedure. Then go with somebody else. Then if it doesn't go, go with other people again. Then if it doesn't go with pastor. I mean, it's then report to church. Then if he doesn't, I mean, the stage. That means Jesus really wants there to be reconciliation. And I'm going to show you by the grace of God, God helping me tonight. If I can do that tonight, that'll be good. If I can, we'll take it to, I will, I will show you the reason for disunity in the body of Christ, the cause of disunity and how to remedy it. There's a way. There is something that causes disunity that we have not paid attention to. Are you here? And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. Wow. Wow. All right, that's it. Are you saying that? He said, make me happy. Paul, he said, make me happy. By being all, all right, agreeing, agreement, agreement. Now, I've already taught you that the unity, the unity of believers is hinged upon truth. And apostolic doctrine. Write that down. Do not forget it. It's an eternal truth. The unity of believers. The unity of believers is hinged. H-I-N-G-E-D. Hinged. Upon truth. Alright. And apostolic doctrine. 
That's what our unity is, is hinged upon. You know what that means? If we will divide as brothers, let it be that we are divided on the basis of truth. What do I mean by that? On the basis of not nitpicking, always finding fault with everyone. On the basis of truth in, in sense that if you default on the essential doctrines of the Christian faith, we are not brothers. Listen, don't always think that division is evil. Division can be a godly thing. You are in a church where manipulations, demonic control, sexual abuse and all those things are taking place and you say, you say I just love my pastor so much. I mean, he's an evil man. He keeps taking from us, beating us, telling us to eat grass, pouring fat on our head in the name of impartation, all those junks. And then you will say, I, but I just love the house of God. Mm -mm -mm. That has been misled. You should leave that church, not only leave that church, go, go away with a, a bunch of people. Why? You are contending earnestly for the faith, which was once delivered. I'm saying there's no new thing in Christianity. It is the old stuff. You we should stay with the old stuff and be faithful to it. Glory be to God. That's what I'm telling you. So that means that now, so what do we see? What do we see? He said, loving one another, then working together with one another with one mind and purpose. So we cannot work together with one mind, Sister Mercy. We cannot work together with one mind and one purpose if we do not love one another. How do I know? Amos, can two walk together except they agree? That means if we are working now here, this if you're in this ministry, if you're if you are if we are together in this ministry, but we do not agree, you are only adding to the number, you are not helping the effectiveness of the work. There are many Christians who are in church, but they do not agree with Christ. So they, they are okay with excitement, but they do not want edification. There are Christians that want prayer point only. They don't want discipleship. That's one of the challenges with modern day Christianity. We prefer Revive 100 to Bible study. Are you here? I'm a very blunt uh, Bible teacher. We must say things as they are. In love, the, the average person prefers Revive 100 to Bible teaching. Forgetting that what we sustain the things you receive in Revive 100 is going to be accurate teaching. This is why in Revive 100 we must teach well and then we will now lead prayer. Since that, so that we will help God's people. Are you here? To teach the word of God is not an easy stuff. But why do we keep laboring in word and doctrine? Because we know that by all means we must still reach them. Amen? Amen. Are you catching something? Yes, That's why I praise those of you that have come for, for Bible study today. I praise you. And all those that are in Bible study online, I praise you. If we agree together, huh, then we can work together. In fact, one of the, way, the ways we know that we love one another is that we care about one another. Huh? We check on one another. Pastor, are you okay today? Ah, I, didn't, I didn't hear you yesterday. Oh, hope you're good. And somebody asked me, oh, then you also asked, oh, how was your day? I, I didn't see you for some time. Oh, hope everything is okay. Say, ah, Thank you for checking on me. I'm okay. Oh, this and that. Uh-huh. But everybody doesn't see everybody for a month, for two months, and nobody cares. That's not love. That's not community. Are you seeing that? Yes. Now, you see, at the root of let, let's talk about the causes of disunity. I teach on this briefly. Then we'll pray. The causes of disunity. Have you taken the 10? You already know them. Please mark the 10 people. Okay, good. They've put their phone numbers there. Please mark them. Now, causes of disunity. Let me say that. Um, because if you look at verse number 3, right? Do you see verse 3? Causes of disunity. Are you ready now? Number one cause of disunity. Selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. Selfishness brings discord. Selfishness brings what? Discord. If you don't put all that first, you, 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 you're not walking in unity. We must learn to show genuine interest in others and in their lives. Of course, not being overly pognosy, you know, overly nosy and you're just trying to, no, mm -mm, not that. I'm saying but genuine care, sincere love. Now, 
showing genuine interest for others putting others ahead of yourself right it's actually a mark of maturity selfishness like cancer ruins good relationships in the body of christ i always want to have my way i always want to play king of the hill not necessary remember the first 10 people only genuine humility right selflessness built up because if fellowship is important to the development of christian character then selfishness becomes the hindrance to spiritual maturity but listen jesus said if any man will come at time let him first take up his deny himself take do you see that deny what's that himself take up his cross and follow me that's the word right there so don't approach listen don't approach life christianity and ministry with a celebrity mindset some people might say uh, getting born again makes you a celebrity it depends on context but i don't think so the way of the cross does not look like a way that you can carry camera and be doing photo shoot is that true on your birthday you can buy new clothes and do photo shoot on the on the way to imagine this or say ah please uh, let's get camera so i'm naked please <laughs> i look at the blood every year is that what jesus did the way of the cross is not palatable to the flesh the flesh is always contrary to the spirit galatians said walk in the spirit so that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh he says for the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and the two are contrary one to another they are loggerheads selfish ambition sorry um right is that what i mentioned yes mark 10 45 the son of man did not come to be served i mean listen do you know it was actually jesus is right if he comes and they are serving uh, he made us now we're made for his prayer and his purpose and his worship and his glory yet he came to save and to give his life as a ransom for many mark 10 45 that tells you that listen you are not christ-like as a leader or as a disciple of jesus christ if your mindset is not service oriented we are called to be servant leaders not celebs ministry is not showbiz it's not showmanship it's taking the towel bending down remember i've taught you the towel principle right you bend down with the towel and wash the feet of others feet washing is is not is not the job for the prince of the house it's a job for the servant are you here that was the idea behind feet washing okay that was why peter said don't wash my feet Jesus said, no, no if you don't you have no part in me peter said bait me <laughs> i love peter so much now you see selfish ambition is very terrible because you know what you do you use the gifts of god to advance selfish interest rather than his kingdom selfish ambition this is how it works working to advance self instead of advancing god's work now um a little history here ambrose a m b r o s e ambrose was actually a great scholar a leader in his own right because he was actually a roman governor at that time and um you know the the bishop in their district all right there was a way all right their governing structure was stratified then now the bishop of their district died and there was need for a successor while people were asking and they were like who will succeed right the bishop now remember ambrose was a governor but was not the only governor okay do you know what happened as people began to ponder on it and you know talk about it and debate and all a child said ambrose bishop ambrose bishop meaning the child was saying let ambrose be bishop and in unison they began to echo that cry ambrose bishop ambrose ambrose could not fathom that he could not con his mind could not contain it that i bishop that night ambrose fled the city and he ran away it was the decree all right and the intervention of the emperor 
that made Ambrose agree to be the Bishop of Milan. What does that tell you? These men were not moved to do ministry on the basis of what they could gain, what they could get for self, but in fact, they, they had a sense of inadequacy. Today, the average young minister wants God to call him. The average Christian is saying, God, why are you running away from calling me? Before, God was asking me, why are you running away? I'm calling you. And men were even saying, don't run from the call of God. God's call is on your life. Now we are the ones saying, see, before God even flashed me, I say, God, use me. It's not that God really should use you. It's that you want to use God to make a name. And in your laziness, you think that ministry is for those who would be laid back, not doing anything, and just enjoying the prestige. And so it's selfish ambition. This is why we're having challenges. Because anywhere there's selfish ambition, other works of the flesh, we find expression. Are you with me? How about John Knox? I, I just mentioned about Ambrose, right? Now, John Knox. John Knox, you also know that in church history, John Knox was a very powerful man. Now, do you know that when John Knox, um, John Ruff, John Ruff was like his pastor. John Ruff was preaching one day and then he summoned John Knox that he feels he should be in the pulpit ministry. John Knox was so petrified and bothered by that. He, he was so sad. He ran away into all right his own chamber and withdrew from people for many days sorrowful crying pleading and all that the average person today saying god give me the mantle of john knox john knox didn't want it yeah. he withdrew he cried he was troubled why because of a sense of unworthiness not ambition read my book the mechanics of preaching why i teach about the call of god that zeal to quickly want to do something for God needs to be checked in our generation. It may not be a sign of a call per se, although there is a zeal and urgency that comes. Like Paul said, necessity is laid upon me. And woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, but that is with a right heart. So the zeal must be a product of a right heart. Not that there is zeal and the heart is terrible because you can be ambitious and zealous. Are you with me? Number two cause for division. Number two cause of division in the body of Christ. Personal prestige. Personal prestige. Remember, we've, we've already touched on don't be selfish, right? Now we are on don't try to impress. Personal prestige. To be admired. To be respected. To be known. Mm, Lord help our hearts to be popular to be exalted to be heralded by all to have a seat on every important platform in fact to be flattered and um, to be worshipped it excites the flesh but it grieves the spirit that's not our goal for Christian service. That's not our goal in Christianity. Although you are the light of the world and he says, let your light shine, but understand the right context. It does not mean go ahead and make everybody know that. Yes. Avoid the, the crave for personal prestige. The incarnation of Jesus. You know, sometimes when we're doing Christology and all that, people say at the incarnation, oh, look at the power of God in the incarnation. But you must also see something beyond that. Or else, your understanding of Philippians 2. Because most people, when they enter Philippians 2, the only verse they know is, let this man be you. We, then he now say, wherefore God has highly exalted him. That's what we quote. But have you seen verse 1? Have you seen verse 2? Have you seen verse 3? Have you seen verse 4? He says, don't try to impress people. In the social media generation, one of the biggest undoing of young ministers today is the crave to impress people. So you post something that is right. You have two likes. You feel like a failure. You really go and delete it. Why? <laughs> then you report <laughs> you said the algorithm now is not is not working well today mm. the incarnation what i want you to see about the incarnation which is very deep is that the incarnation was an act of humility immortal invisible 
God only wise now died on the cross. Can you think about his mystery beyond comprehension? The one who made me dying in the hands of the ones that he made. Uh, they are weeping. You know what it means? God knows the that which that whip was made. He made what they made the whip from. Every uh, he can he can tell everything about it, including he can x-ray the hand and tell every bone and everything that is there. He can tell that man's life from the big from the day he was conceived, giving history. Yet he allowed the whip to be touching his skin. Ah. The incarnation was an act of humility. Because I don't think if I am God, I will become man. You, you, th you think you will become man? Thank you. The omnipotent. Remember when I teach on omnipotent. You know when I teach on the attributes of God is always awesome. The omnipotent God. That created the sun, moon and stars. And some of you will think sun, moon and stars in that order. That the sun is the biggest. Whereas this, there are stars that are bigger than the sun. And the sun is a thousand over a thousand times bigger than the earth. Yet, even the moon, they are nothing in comparison to the voice of God because it is through the speakings of God that the moon, the stars, everything came together. The giant whales at the just response of the God. Yet, this God will now die on one stupid stick or one with the as a ah, Galatians 3 13. The one that knew no sin was made cause for us. Ah. For cause is everyone that can get on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles and that we might receive the promise of the spiritual faith. Come on, he was made to be a cause so that we can be blessed. Ah, this God is awesome. You see why he was able to fulfill his assignment? No selfish ambition, no aim for personal prestige. The incarnation was an act of humility. Humility starts with thoughts, then attitudes, then actions dead reactions your thoughts remember when we get philippians 2 5 right let this mind be you humility humility number three very quickly cause of disunity we'll stop with that today and then we'll pick it up next week all right is that is that okay yes if you have questions you can begin to leave them now question number three uh point number three cause the first cause of disunity is what somebody's not speaking is what now Type it in the comment section. All right. The cause of disunity. The first cause is what? Let me know you're following. Is what? Selfish, Selfish ambition. ambition. Number two is what? Number three. Focus and obsession slash pride. Some people do not know that pride actually has to do with zooming in on yourself pride focuses more all right on self than on god and than on others be careful of this life that revolves all around you be careful of this christianity that is all about you for it may not be the will of the lord for you let me give an example of what i mean all your prayer points from January till now is just for yourself. No intercession for nobody. For the church of God, for your pastor, for ministry, for ministers, for the world, for the nation, for the government, for your family. It's just you, only you. That means you're, you're not really a person of prayer. You are a selfish praying person. Your prayer will not be effectual. It will not be far. It may be far then, but it will not be effectual. It will not make power available. It will not be dynamic. It is working. Are you are we together yes, sir. now look at this remember the bible says that before every fall is actually pride the bible says god looks at the proud afar off where there is pride there will be contentions where there is pride there will be every evil work somebody say with me where there is pride, there, is pride. there will be strife go to proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10 let's see Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10. This will bless you. Pride shows. Do you know pride shows in how we react to people when they do things to us? Do you know it shows in how we also talk? When we talk down on everyone. It's pride. Proverbs chapter 13. When we try to flaunt everything that we have. To let them know we are the best. Listen, it's pride. 
Proverbs 13 verse 10. Let's read. Pride leads to conflict. Those who take advice are why. What does your own version say? Uh, when there is pride, there is strife. Proverbs 13 10. Is that in your Bible? There should be, I think that's what it is now. And when there is strife, huh, there's going to be every evil works. Because if there is strife, strife and evil works, they are friends. You know why? Because there'll be unhealthy competition. Are you seeing the cause of our division? You know why some of us are angry at one another? It's not because it's, it's pride. Somebody will not listen to truth. Somebody will not obey the scripture. Somebody begins to see his or herself as superior to scripture. That what he says is superior to what the Bible says. Huh? Pride. For some of us, even our pride shows in our expectation. We expect people to greet us first. To give to us first. To worship us. To post us on our birthday. So if they don't do this, we feel everybody owes us. That's pride. Nobody, tell yourself, nobody owes me anything. Yes. Even in ministry, I believe what I'm doing, I'm doing it because I love God. As a human, there are times I feel, ah, reciprocate, but that's being human. That does not mean that. Are you seeing that? Yes. Let's not be proud. Some of us, our pride shows in our unwillingness to receive rebuke. He that is often rebuked, but chooses to be stubborn. He says he will be destroyed with sudden destruction. Yoruba Vashon says, And that without remedy. There are a lot of examples of pride in scripture. Is that true? Herod, pride. Nebuchadnezzar, pride. And many others who think that. Listen, when you start feeling you are self-sufficient, it's a sign of pride. When you start feeling you don't need others. Listen, the way the body of Christ was designed, it was designed that we are members of his body. That means the best of us is an effective member in the body. That means if you are a joint, you are only a joint, you are not the whole body. No man is an island. We are meant to complement one another, not compete with one another. If for us, life is a competition, whose prizes we must win, we will always think of other human beings and other Christians, co-workers, colleagues, as enemies opponents who must be pushed out of the way rather than supported we see them as our competitors you know what that means if somebody starts ministering down the street if there is pride and selfishness i'll start saying may god not let them thrive or oh, they are evil they are a hey. that's pride we should rejoice with them that rejoice we are all one in Christ. If we are in Christ, then we are one. Check your life and let me check my life. Is there selfish ambition? Is there crave for personal prestige? Some ministers will be invited to a program. And there are five ministers in the lineup. And they will tell the inviter, invitees or inviters, I don't know, the host, to design a flyer that has them and the most prestigious among the... This has happened to me once. I've seen it happen. All right? It's not... I'm not telling you calling it by Facebook. I've seen it in ministry. And a minister will say, you know what? Cut myself and the biggest apostle in the program. Give us a own flyer. That's the one I want to share. The ones that others are, they are nobodies. We don't want them. Ministers like that quickly fade with time. And if they do not fade, they will be alive, but they will not make a mark that God approves of. That you are viral does not mean you are doing God's will. Are we together? Yes, so, I mean, pride manifests in many ways. For some of us, pride is that if your neighbor does not come and pay homage to you, uh, they are not worthy to be your neighbor. Who are you now? Are you an idol? Well, I know we have brought idolatry to the world, to the church, too. All right? For the first is American idol. Now it's Nigerian idol. Do you know what an idol is? Do you think an idol is something? To, it does not matter which shade. An idol is a bad thing. Anything that seeks to take the place of God in the hearts of men is an idol. We must do away with it. And for some of us, our works has become our idol. You know why? We get our security from our job, our salary, our looks, rather than God. That's your idol. Anything that gives you security apart from Christ is your idol. 
When you say, oh, my shape, oh, God, this shape, this is it. It's an idol. Because the day you have pimples and your face is, you say, oh, God, I will not go out today because I have pimples. Idol. If there are questions, you can release your questions. But we want to go before the Lord in prayer. And you want to ask the Lord and say, Father, I want to be more like Christ. And then you talk to the Lord about the issues of the heart. Is it selfish ambition? Is it a crave for personal prestige? Is it this focus and obsession with self and pride? Go before the Lord and say, Father, do a deep work in my heart. Let my life honor you now and always. Father, we bow ourselves before you. We ask that the cross will continue a deep work through the ministry of the word and the spirit. We will not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but in lowliness of heart, we would esteem others better than ourselves. And we would see ourselves as members in the body, serving God's will and God's purpose. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Glory be to God. Hey there, I'm Olari Waju Kolawoli, Setman Kingdom Network International Ministries. Thank you very much for making time to see this video. I hope that was a blessing to you. If that's true, please like, leave your comment and your feedback, and do well to share with your friends and families so that it can also edify them. Our books are also available on Amazon and on Seller. You'll see them on your screen. Please purchase them, read them, and then buy for others. If you're led to give to the ministry, you're going to see the account details on the screen. And just type it and make payment as the Lord has blessed you. Please do well to subscribe so that you'll be notified as more updates will be coming. God bless you.